Thank you, Tamar. And thanks for everything you've done to make this conversation happen. Thank you. Um, so my name is Dina Fuchs. Um, as Tamar said, I'm the Senior Director of Strategy and Partnership at the Avi Chai Foundation. Um, I really just wanted to spend a minute or two just to give you a little bit of background as to how this report came to be um, and why Avi Chai has funded it. Um, Avi Chai was founded in 1984 by Sanford Bernstein. He built his financial services firm on the value of his research. And he took the same approach to his philanthropy. And all of the, the strategic decisions that we've made, um, the foundation has made over the past 30 years, has been um, research and data driven. And nearly 15 years ago, Avichai realized that the approach that we've taken to our data dr driven decision making has potential benefits for other funders, communal um, decision makers. And we decided to create an arm of the foundation that was focused on research and policy. And that arm was what uh, we call the Center for Research and Policy. Um, it's led by uh, Professor Jack Wertheimer. And the, the goal was really to serve as an intellectual resource to the Jewish community, um, particularly in areas where we weren't actually a financial resource to the community. Um, we've supported research in areas related to where we fund and in many areas ancillary to our work. And the goal was to inform communal conversations. So this report, Giving Jewish, um, is really is our latest project. Um, we're enormously gratified by the response that the foundation's been getting to it. Um, there have been very spirited conversations in the media, online, in person, and there are many more um, conversations being planned. Today's conversation is uh, poised to be incredibly interesting, and I really want to just uh, just take a minute to thank. Andres and Tamar for, uh, for raising the topics that are going to be discussed today. Um, and I think that's enough for me. I really just want us to move to the conversation. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the two speakers today um, and um, let them take it from there. So these are lengthy bios. Um, Jack Wertheimer is professor of American Jewish history at the Jewish Theological Seminary, where he served also as provost for a decade. He writes on the religious, communal, and educational spheres of American Jewish life, particularly in recent decades. As director of the Center for Research and Policy at the Avi Chai Foundation, he has overseen projects about Jewish supplementary schools, young Jewish leaders, and the nexus of the family, community, and Jewish education. He, oversees a case study pro he oversaw a case study project on how Jewish schools enact their Jewish missions. With Alex Thompson and Chagit HaKohen Wolf, he co authored a study sponsored by Abichai, um, Hearts and Minds Israel Education in North American Jewish Day Schools. All of the reports that I just cited to you and all of that research is available on the Abichai website, so you should feel free to take a look if any of that's of interest. Um, together with Alex Thompson, he also co authored Hebrew for What? Hebrew at the Heart of Jewish Day Schools. Among the books he has written are, or edited are People Divided Judaism in Contemporary America learning and community, Jewish supplementary schools in the 21st century, and new Jewish leaders reshaping the American Jewish landscape and imagining the American Jewish community. In the fall of 2018, his book, The New American Judaism, How Jews Practice Their Religion is scheduled to appear. Um, Andres Spokane is president and CEO of Jewish Funders Network, the longtime Jewish communal leader with a history of leading successful organizational transformations the CEO of Federation CJA in Montreal from 2009 to 2011. He helped fundamentally change the Federation's operations and its relationship with the community. In Montreal, as a young out-of-the-box Federation executive, he spearheaded a new branding strategy and initiated and developed innovative community programs that are now being used as models across North America. Before joining the Federation, Andres worked for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee in Paris. As regional director for Northeast Europe, he was responsible for a number of pan-European projects, leading programs in the areas of welfare, leadership development, youth renewal, education, community development and outreach, and building coalitions with local and international organizations, public and private. So um, I think we're gonna start this conversation with Jack just giving us an overview of the report. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot in there and I think it may pay to just sort of lay out the trends that you had seen in your research. Great. Thank you very much, Dina. Uh, so just by way, by way of introduction, first of all, my thanks to you, Andres, and to the Jewish Funders Network for hosting me, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. We're, we're honored. 
thank you with you as well as with the, uh, the people who are participating in this uh, on, on the webinar. And I also uh, want to extend my uh, gratitude to the Abi Chai Foundation, uh, for which, with which I've been engaged now for over 15 years, um, and a long partnership that I've had specifically with Tina Fuchs. So thank you. Uh, so a word of background about this study, um, and it's of more personal, of a more personal nature. Uh, in 1997, I published a study that appeared in the American Jewish Yearbook, in which I tried to capture the Jewish philanthropic scene then. Uh, in other words, slightly over 20 years ago. Uh, and in more recent years, as I've been making the rounds and speaking with people, what's become amply clear to me is that the scene that I described in 1997 looks very different or looked very different in 2017, let alone in 2018. And what I wanted to do then with this project was to try to capture what are some of the major new uh, or newly developing trends uh, in Jewish philanthropy in the United States. One of the things that uh, I heard about loud and clear was about the shrinking base of donors. That is to say that uh, there are fewer donors uh, who are uh, responsible now for an increasing sum uh, of the philanthropy that is being collected. Sometimes the figure that I've been given is that we rely upon 10% of the donors to provide 90% of our budgets. In other cases, it's 20% of the donors provide 80% of the budgets. It falls somewhere in there. Uh, and that then focused me on the whole question of donors. Who are these donors and, and what, what do we know about them? So the study in question, um, giving Jewish, how big funders have transformed American Jewish philanthropy, focuses just on that, on big givers. Um, it's not about average donors, well, like, like me. Uh, it's about those who give larger sums. The, the, uh, kind of the threshold that I established for this study was contributions of a half a million dollars or more to Jewish causes alone. Um, this particular study did not focus on what uh, individuals of Jewish origin and Jewish background are giving to non-sectarian causes. That's an interesting topic in its own right, uh, but that's not what I was studying. I wanted to know more about the, the, the structure and the, the populations that are supporting uh, Jewish institutional life in the United States and abroad for that matter uh, as well. Um, and so what quickly emerged in my speaking with uh, individuals at foundations, at um, uh, individuals who have their own donor advised funds or who give in other large ways, uh, as well as conversations with individuals who are personnel at not-for-profits, uh, is that there are really a number of different types of big givers. Uh, and I want to just itemize them. It's important that we appreciate that there are a number of different types. Um, those that are best known, of course, are the national foundations or the large foundations that primarily focus on national giving. Um, they certainly have become major players. Uh, in, at the end of the 20th century, there was a lot of talk about mega donors. Um, these were some of the largest, the ones who were responsible for creating Birthright Israel, for example, and a number of other such important programs. But over the course of this century, many new foundations have been established and continue to be established that take an interest in Jewish giving. Um, and so, so one sector then of the, the giving comes from the large foundations. We don't know precisely, and this is something that, that Andres and I probably will be speaking about together shortly, we don't know pre precisely how, how, what the total dollar sum is. The estimate that I've come up with with the help of research that, was, that has been done by others uh, is that roughly $6 billion worth of uh, philanthropy is donated to Jewish causes uh, by American Jews uh, annually. Um, again, to Jewish causes. That also, by the way, does not include monies that are coming into Jewish institutions through uh, various kinds of government programs, uh, let alone through fees for services. I'm talking about philanthropy exclusively. Um, looking at the 990 reports uh, that are required 
of uh, foundations. Um, what we, I was able to establish with a team of uh, individuals who worked with me on this was that the 250 largest uh, foundations that is largest in terms of what they give to Jewish causes uh, give somewhere in the vicinity of a billion dollars a year to Jewish causes. So that's one billion out of six billion. Uh, Two billion comes through the federation system, which has been, um, uh, what shall I say, often dismissed as uh, yesterday's news, uh, as, a, as a 20th century organization that doesn't fit into the 21st century. And yet uh, the reality is, is that federations for all of the difficulties that they encounter still are contributing uh, or channeling, I should actually say, uh, roughly two billion out of those $6 billion of philanthropy. Um, most of that is actually not coming through their annual campaigns. Uh, the larger percentage is coming from uh, various types of other funds that have been established, either under the umbrella of federations or in, through Jewish communal funds that in some way are connected loosely or more tightly to Jewish federations. The third important um, type of philanthropist uh, is, uh, for want of a better term, the smaller big giver. Um, and I'm not in any way denigrating this. We're talking about individuals who are still giving many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, they're not necessarily giving to national causes, but they are vital for the, the sustaining of local Jewish institutions. Uh, and that's a whole story that we need to uh, reflect on, uh, because uh, while the foundations are getting uh, are primarily, not exclusively, but primarily concerned with uh, larger nationwide, if not North American-wide, uh, and also international giving, um, there are local givers who attend to the needs of their communities. And by that, I mean those who support federations. Uh, but in addition to that, they support local Jewish day schools, local Jewish camps. Uh, they support the Moshe houses. They support the Hillels. They support many and the camps. Um, they, uh, they are vital for the sustaining of Jewish life. So those are the three major categories of big givers. And I don't want uh, to leave you with the impression that these are sealed boxes. The reality is that there are some national big givers who do attend to the needs of their local institutions quite generously. There also are individuals who sustain their local communities, but also give nationally and certainly internationally to, uh, to Israeli uh, causes. Um, the big difference is that uh, there's been an explosion in the numbers of these national foundations. Um, and these national foundations have something going for them that most federations don't. Federations have committed their funds even before they've even raised them for the year. Uh, they have allocated their funds, or at least planned on how they're going to do their allocations. Foundations have uh, discretionary funds available, um, and uh, to use a term that's been popularized in the larger philanthropic community, foundations provide the risk capital for Jewish life. And for that reason, they get a great deal of attention. Um, but uh, it's important that we put their contribution, important as it is, uh, into perspective. Of the, the, that is the larger $6 billion perspective. Um, in, in learning more, trying to learn more about funders, I look not only in terms of, of uh, where they're giving, but also about emerging, if you will, pockets of funders that may have been around in the past, but were not really attended to very much, but today we're paying a lot more attention to them. Um, and the specific ones that I want to mention in this connection are, number one, uh, the rising significance of women. Jewish women as funders of uh, Jewish causes. Um, women are playing that role in, in some measure uh, because they are amassing wealth on their own. 
uh, in uh, other uh, women are playing that role because they have inherited responsibility for foundations or for donor advised funds from their parents and even grandparents, and they are therefore making important decisions, priority, prioritizing decisions. Um, and so uh, women, uh, and, and women also are inheriting money from husbands who have accumulated, amassed large sums of money. So women are important players, or, and they're going to become more important as time goes on. I stress this point because we have enough anecdotal information about the, the lack of attention, for want of a better terminology, being paid to women while their husbands are still alive, while their parents are still alive, and that ends up blowing up in the faces of some not-for-profits who really haven't paid attention, and suddenly these women who have not been attended to uh, and not been educated and socialized into giving Jewish decide that when they have responsibility, they prefer to give elsewhere. I should also add parenthetically that a growing number of women are uh, serving as the chair people uh, for uh, important foundations uh, and also as the top executives and as well as other executives of these foundations. The second group that I want to mention which does not have, an, if you will, a national impact um, are growing numbers of Haredi Jews uh, who are vitally important for the sustaining of Haredi institutions, often referred to as ultra-Orthodox, a term that I don't really like, um, but uh, there are growing numbers of individuals in this community that are taking responsibility. Um, and the, the third group that I want to mention, and with that I will conclude my, my introductory comments at least, um, are millennials. And millennials are, uh, of course, the great question mark. Um, there's a lot of hand-wringing that goes on in the Jewish community. Will the millennials be interested in Jewish life? Will they be interested in the established uh, Jewish institutions? Will they be interested in giving to Jewish causes? And um, as millennials are still in their 20s and their 30s, uh, we don't really know the answer to that question. But there is some evidence that there are millennials who are stepping up and who are concerned with Jewish causes. Birthright Israel has played some role uh, in influencing them. Uh, all kinds of Orthodox outreach programs and other kinds of, of programming reaching millennials is also, are also uh, kind of drawing millennials into Jewish engagement. Um, uh, and so uh, while there is a concern about whether millennials will continue the traditions of their parents, whether or not they give to the exact same Jewish causes is perhaps secondary to whether they will give to Jewish causes. And there is evidence that a fair number of them are interested, either because they feel a responsibility to support the legacies of their own parents and grandparents, or because they have those commitments themselves. Uh, and with that, I turn it over to you, Andres. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, and, and thank you to uh, Dina and to the Abichai Foundation for supporting this research. Uh, I mean, I can't stress uh, enough how important data and research is and how preciously little of it, few of it, 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 it is there in the Jewish community. So, kola kavod and kola kavod on the amazing work. Um, let, 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 me, let me ask you a couple of questions um, about, about the research. Um, some of them are, are methodological. Like, it is very difficult to get an accurate picture of Jewish philanthropy for a number of reasons. First of all, religious organizations don't, don't have to file a 990, therefore there's a whole black hole. We don't really know how much money goes there. There is uh, donor advice funds, etc. So, how, how did you work around it, and how how accurate do you think the picture that you paint is, or how much of it is an estimation based on that on your best your, right. your best information? Right. right. So, if I can qualify your question, you ask you, know, you made the comment that it's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, no, it's impossible. <laughs> um, the truth is, we really have no way of knowing precisely how 
exactly how much money is being given. We have to work with estimates. For some of the reasons that you outlined, as well as some additional ones, uh, there's a great deal of philanthropy um, that is not easily traceable. Um, I came up with the $7 billion figure, to be honest with you, um, uh, thanks to an article and research that was done by a journalist um, uh, at the Forward, uh, who um, tried to study this from the perspective of the grantees right. and those 990s that, that grantees have submitted, but as you correctly state, Religious institutions don't have to state, uh, don't have to file these 990s, and that's a huge black hole. The religious sphere in philanthropy in general in America is the largest one. So we know that we've got, a, whether that's true, by the way, of Jewish philanthropy, I'm not sure. But there's certainly a very large uh, black hole there. Um, so um, to answer your question now directly, I decided not to get too hung up on the dollars. Right. Um, I tried to come up with my best estimates. Um, I wish I knew of better ways of getting at this. Uh, just one small example, you mentioned donor advised funds. Uh, these are um, often parked under the umbrella of Jewish communal funds, some of which actually do break down the, 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 the proportions going to Jewish versus non-sectarian, um, uh, Jews, Jewish of the United States versus international. Uh, but then we also know that vast sums are uh, uh, held at places such as Vanguard and Fidelity and Shroud, and they don't, they don't offer that kind of reporting. For that reason, this report is not primarily quantitative, but rather qualitative. Look for trends in, um, in, in the big picture. Thank you. And uh, I think that um, for us at JFN, uh, I know we're talking about how impossible it is to get to the actual figure of, of, of philanthropy, but one of the values we really insist on is uh, transparency, uh, because the more we know about where the money is going, the more planning we can do, or the better planning we can do for the community as a whole, identify gaps, the underserved um, uh, areas, etc. cetera. Um, you mentioned in the in the report uh, some of the bigger foundations dissociating themselves from communal giving, especially from federation, which is a trend that we've we've, we've been seeing in the last few years, etc. Now, uh, from our vantage point at JFN, we see also a counter trend. We see that some of the large fun funders that actually started their philanthropy in opposition, as it, as it were, to common philanthropy, now are re-engaging in a different way. They look at federations as the delivery mechanisms for their projects. Let's think about PJ Library, for example, yes. that works through federations, yes. or, or Birthright itself, it works through federations. So mm -hmm. how, how much weight would you give to that counter trend? Um, I, I give a lot of weight to it, actually. Yeah. Um, I think that what we are, you said it well uh, when, when you noted that uh, some of these foundations, when they started out, um, had a great deal of disdain mm -hmm. for, well, you didn't say that, I'm saying it. <laughs> um, they had a great deal of disdain for federations uh, and for other types of institutions, the so-called legacy institutions, right. which are constantly being beaten up on. Um, and yet, as time has gone on, they have come to realize that they need operators. They, unless they, they want to become operating foundations, and there are some that have, then how are they going to get the work done? And so they have been turning to federations. Uh, in other cases, they've been turning to, uh, to local funders, uh, asking for them to, to pitch in, uh, and to local institutions to, to carry some of the responsibility on the local level. And I think that your example of PJ yeah. Library is a perfect example of that. Uh, but it's spreading beyond that. Um, uh, One Table, for example, right. is also looking for local, uh, not only funders, but all local operators who will help them out with this. Um, I think that there's a growing understanding um, that, um, that the big foundations can't do it all by themselves, uh, or if they want to do it by themselves, then they're taking on a very big burden of responsibility. And concomitantly, I think the, the federations are also realizing that taking that role to which they were averse in the past yes. of being a vehicle for donors rather 
the, 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 the paradigm was the opposite, was we know where the needs are, I'm paraphrasing, yes. we know where the needs are, give us your money, we're going to do it because we know, and it was true, they knew it, but now they're shifting that and say we are ready to play that role for funders. Yes, yes. Um, I, it's, it's important that you raise that point, that, that this does require a rethinking on the part of federations. Um, some of that rethinking has to do with their partnering with big funders uh, on specific projects. Some of it also has to do with their um, uh, willingness to be open to giving that's not unrestricted annual giving, right. but other types of giving. And yes, there's no question that there have been tensions within federations. Uh, some federations have been, in my view, savvier than others, and they are reaping the, 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 the benefits of that. Right. Um, something that is being discussed a lot in the secular community, uh, not so much in the Jewish community, but it's being felt, is the ethical dimensions of the growth of large funders. Uh, the feeling is, um, again, in the secular community, that funders that funders are actually setting policies by the sheer weight of their contributions, and that is somehow subverting democratic, you know, norms of governance. The, 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 the most known example is the one in Newark with yes. Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. who put hundred million dollars into reshaping the school system, which is great, but on the other hand, people are saying, wait a minute, nobody elected you to, re to, to reshape the school system in our district. So yes. do you see some of that at play? Uh, and what do you think are the ethical dilemmas that funders need to grapple with as they try to, as they as they get to, willingly or unwillingly, to a place of larger power and larger influence in the Jewish community. Yes. Yeah. So I, um, I'm not sure I would use the word ethical here, mm -hmm. but you did use the word uh, democracy before. Right. Uh, represent, representation of the interests of the community. And for me, the larger question is also um, uh, attending to or caring for the collective needs of the Jewish people. So you have funders who have their pet projects, there's one here and there's one there, but who is looking out for the, the totality of those needs? That was a role that federations played. Some would say they played it uh, only partially effectively in the past, but they, federations have taken responsibility, at least on the local level, um, for the total needs within their communities. Um, and foundations are not playing that kind of a role. Uh, and I, I find that, that very troubling. It's, is it unethical? I don't think so. It's certainly not illegal, what they're doing, but it's problematic. And it's also problematic because, as you noted, by using the word democracy, um, they are playing an important role in setting uh, agendas um, but who appointed them to do that? And they're self-appointed, they, and they do it by virtue of the power of the purse that, that they have. Um, you mentioned the Mark Zuckerberg example, and, and I want to come back to that because you also earlier made reference to transparency. And the context of your remarks was transparency about, about where people are giving. That's, that's one form of transparency. But there's another form of transparency, and that is the extent to which these foundations and other kinds of big givers are prepared to be transparent about what has worked and what has not worked so that others can learn from their, uh, from what they've learned and also from their mistakes. Um, the, the, the infamous case of Mark Zuckerberg, and there have been other such examples where huge sums of money have been wasted and in some cases have actually done more harm than good. Um, they've gotten written up in, in some places. Uh, in the Jewish community, I'm not aware that we've had a press uh, that has been on top of this um, and also that we've had foundations that have taken responsibility for trying to educate others as to what they've learned and have not learned. And outside of the Jewish philanthropic world, there in fact are foundations that have published reports, including reports that have not portrayed them in the most positive of light, because we tried something and it didn't work. 
So that's not a crime, that's not a sin, but why can't others learn from that? Mistake? Right, right. And, and you know, you, you remind me that the, uh, at the time, the, the first Jefferson conference that I organized, uh, the opening plenary was about failure, was about founders sharing their, their failures. But, but, but I do see some good trends here in terms of funders trying to be more open. Uh, a number of big foundations have commissioned uh, grantee reports yes. of how the, how the grantee perceives them. And that's, I think, it's a, it's a salutary trend. Uh, it can help us a little bit. But, but the, the ultimate question is that philanthropy doesn't really have any external control, except the IRS, that doesn't control much. Yes. So at some point in time, philanthropy will need to establish its own you know, self, um, self-controlled self mechanisms to use that power in, in, wise, in wise ways. Right. Well, I don't know whether it will have to, but one can hope that it will. Yeah, exactly. Well, they will have to if they, if they want to be use that power more responsibly and more, yes. and more yes. responsibly. And, and that takes me to your points about uh, millennials. Yes. Because I, I tend to think that millennials care about these issues um, to, a, to, a, to a bigger proportion than their elders. Is that, is that the case? Uh, again, um, at this point, we can only, I can only speak from, anecdot- with, from anecdotal evidence. Um, but uh, certainly what one hears is that millennials uh, seem to be more concerned about that. They certainly are more concerned about targeting uh, their giving. Uh, that's, not, that's not the same as transparency necessarily. Right. But um, as they are also involved in non-sectarian giving, they are learning how outside of the Jewish philanthropic world, more attention is being paid right. to things like that. Right. Yes. And uh, do you um, do you see that from what you learn about millennials? I mean, you, you say that there are three groups that are coming up: mm-hmm. women, Orthodox, and uh, mm-hmm. millennials. Um, we found out in our own research and interacting with our own members that millennials are uh, by manifold more likely to use new philanthropic vehicles, mm-hmm. like giving circles, mm-hmm. like online platforms, um, impact investing, what have you. Did you see any hint of that while you were doing this report? Uh, I, I saw more than many hints of that, yes, yeah. sure. Um, look, we, we know uh, perhaps the most successful such, uh, if you want to call it a giving circle, is Natan, right. uh, which has attracted millennials and generation extras also. Uh, and serves as a very important edu- educating vehicle. I've spoken to some of the um, active people in that time. I'm talking about uh, not, not the leadership, but but the participants um, who talk about how uh, they've been educated uh, through uh, through that time about Jewish needs and also about uh, exciting new initiatives that are taking place and that, that they may want to fund. Um, and, uh, but having said that, um, I, I don't want to dismiss the federations from this uh, from this equation, um, because there are federations that are working to uh, at, at drawing in uh, millennials, involving them in not only in their programs but also in in their planning processes. Um, and it's true not only of federations, it's true also of some of the large Jewish organizations that have programs that are specifically geared to, uh, to millennials and generation Xers as a way of socializing them. And I, I want to underscore that point. Um, this may be a, too gross a generalization, but Jewish big givers uh, in the 20th century, the second half of the 20th century, were generally... Um, socialized and educated about Jewish needs by federation executives whom they work with and who often they trusted, not only in terms of giving to the federation, but to other uh, causes. Um, What we now are lacking mechanisms for those 
uh, younger Jews who are not involved in federations. So who is guiding them? Who is educating them? And part of the answer is these giving circles. They are serving as socializing and, and educating uh, uh, institutions. Um, and one last comment about this. What I've learned, uh, which I found quite moving, is that there are some very significant donors who devote some of their time to mentoring younger up-and-coming people. And uh, by virtue of their status, of their accomplishments, of their fame, um, they are able to draw in um, some of these younger people. Um, and that's all to the good, from my point of view. We need more of that. Right, right. And a lot of the, uh, the young funders in our orbit, they, they actually complain that in their own foundations, their own family foundations, they are still sitting at the kids' table. Yes. And that's, that's a big demotivator for some uh, that's not, not, not wise. Yeah. yeah. And, and especially when it comes to issues like Israel, for example, that within a family, you will have very different views. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But that's a little bit like synagogues that, uh, that bar children from the synagogue, and then they're surprised when these children grow up and feel that there's no place for them in the synagogue. Right. And it's, I, I, think, I think it's parallel. Yeah. It, now, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned women. Do you, uh, uh, is there any, and of course, it would be unwise to make a big generalization, but do you, can you identify some sort of emerging trends in, in terms of things that women are going to be doing different than men in philanthropy. Right. So there, there is, as I'm sure you will know, uh, uh, a literature on this, uh, yeah. uh, it, not in terms of the Jewish community, but in terms of philanthropy in general, um, that women tend to do this as opposed to men who do, tend to do that. Frankly, I've shied away from those kinds of generalizations. I'm not sure how helpful they really are because women are individuals with their own ways of, of doing things. And um, so I'm, I'm going to shy away from that. Uh, but you do think that there is a desire of women philanthropies being actively identified as women philanthropies? or as philanthropies that happen to be women. Yeah, yeah, so that, that too, it's hard to generalize about. Right. We know, of course, that there are um, a growing number of Jewish women's foundations. These tend to um, uh, raise limited sums of money. When we're talking about big giving, this is not big giving. But again, it's another setting in which women are being educated, uh, about philanthropy, that is. Um, um, but there are certainly are, are some women who um, have taken it upon themselves specifically to uh, address through their philanthropy uh, gender types of, of issues. Uh, the glass ceiling is an example of that. The, uh, the, the whole question of, uh, of unequal salaries. Uh, using kind of those, their leverage uh, to bring about change. Um, but we also know that there's significant uh, women, very significant roles, uh, who regard themselves as philanthropists, and their being women is not uh, kind of the, the major criterion of their Right. Well, when you talk about the, the Haredi population, yes. um, I mean, we know that they are funding very generously uh, their own communal institutions. Yes. Do you see any emerging trend of them getting involved in a wider Right. A set of communal issues yeah. or? So that, that's again, I was going to say a $64,000, but it's a lot more than $64,000 question. Um, at this point, I don't see evidence of that. Uh, I think that, that what I've heard about is that Haredim tend to be supportive of their local institutions and uh, yeshivas. Uh, such as the Lakewood Yeshiva or Navy Israel in Baltimore that actually educate people from all around the country uh, and support also for Israeli uh, yeshivas and other types of, of institutions. Um, I, I have not seen evidence of that kind of breaking out um, from that community. I think there's more evidence of modern Orthodox Jews right. who are involving themselves um, there are modern Orthodox Jews who are active in their local federations, as an example. There are modern Orthodox Jews uh, who are active uh, in supporting organizations that are not necessarily uh, Orthodox organizations. 
Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a, what should I say, a, a willingness to reach beyond one, one's immediate group. Right. Um, and just as an example of the flip side of this, uh, it so happens that I was at a, studying a day school uh, two weeks ago in the Midwestern community, uh, it was a community day school, and I was told that a, an active member of a reformed temple uh, had given very significant sums to the two Jewish day schools in the community, one of them a modern Orthodox one, mm -hmm. and one of them in the community day school. Um, so we certainly have examples then of, of people in other sectors that are open to supporting institutions in the Orthodox world. And um, the question is whether there will be more reciprocity. Right, right. Um, when you talk about funders being more targeted, you're actually tangentially alluding to one of the biggest problems of philanthropy today, which is funding for capacity, for overhead, the so much reviled yes. overhead. Um, and this is an issue that we, we deal with it a lot, like the need to fund appropriate capacity and not starve the nonprofits um, of, the, of the basic infrastructure they need to operate. Yes. Do you see any trends in that regard? Um, my short answer is I don't know enough to be able to answer that question, but to me that does touch upon an ethical issue. Right. Um, in two ways. The foundations, um, there are some foundations that don't want to support overhead. They only want to support a particular program that's being run, uh, but often that diverts personnel uh, that are involved in other things. Um, and the other piece of this, which I, which I didn't touch upon yet, but the report covers, is that uh, foundations are increasingly demanding uh, reporting, you alluded to this before, uh, metrics demonstrate to us that what you say you are doing, you're actually accomplishing. And I think those are very important questions that are being asked, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of personnel to uh, compile those metrics, to compile those reports. And so I do think that foundations have an ethical responsibility to, uh, to finance uh, those as opposed to um, derailing uh, other other programs of being funded by a particular not-for-profit. Yeah, in our in, in our uh, parlance, we say you either fund overhead or you, or you force non-profits to lie to you about how much they actually need for, for yes. to, to keep their operation going. Yeah. Um, do you see any trend? And I have a ton of questions. So, uh, Tamar, you. Uh, Tell me if there are questions from the audience because I can go on forever, right? So uh, as we as we move on, um, is do you think? And I'm going to ask you like this is a a difficult one. Do you think that the influence of great of bigger funders in setting a communal agenda is somehow disproportionate? with the contribution that they make in, in dollars. When you look at the entire system, when you think that probably 90% of communal institutions in this country haven't heard of a large funder, like synagogues and day schools and... Yes, yes, yeah. Um, so, of, of course, you know, that, that is a loaded question, but I did try to tackle it, first of all, by placing the funding of these large foundations into the larger context of just how much philanthropy is being raised. Um, but the other context, of course, is, is that these foundations um, are provide the risk capital. Uh, and that tends to draw the attention. Um, the press loves to write about this as an example. Um, and certainly um, the sexier programs, uh, because they are innovative, uh, are, are supported by foundations. Um, but um, uh, uh, I think that they're getting disproportionate attention, which is why I worked on trying to uh, highlight the importance of sustaining work that it works, philanthropy that is occurring within local communities. Right. Because local institutions, and I don't only mean federations now, um, rely upon those sustainers who don't have national reputations. The, the, uh, you, you mentioned 
uh, in in passing the focusing of smaller funders in local in, in local philanthropy. I know it's not it's yes. not black and white. Yes. There is a lot of big funders that are also major givers in their communities. Right. But do you see and, and 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 on the other side, you have very few local donors invested heavily in national organizations. So do you see any way of bridging that gap? In other words, making local funders understand the need for important organizations, for uh, national organizations. You fund your local day school, but your local day school needs Prisma. Yes. And, you know, and, and conversely, you fund Prisma, but your organization, uh, I mean, you need to support local schools. And right. So um, it's, it's, it's not to the same extent. Um, but um, th there are local donors, of course, that do give to national organizations. I'm a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, the monies that we raise are not only raised from, uh, from donors in the New York metropolitan area, uh, and that's the same is true of Yeshiva University, the same is true of the Hebrew Union College, and those are, those are the seminaries, if you will. But it's true also of the Jewish Museum, it's true of of lots of uh, local cultural and educational uh, institutions. Um, so, in, in fact, there are local donors who are making that leap. They're not making the leap necessarily to fund Birthright Israel, although some of them are. Birthright Israel actually receives contributions uh, from several thousand people. We, we hear a lot about Sheldon Adelson, who clearly is carrying the, the, the bulk of the, of the responsibility, but there are lots of local donors who are giving to that as well. Um, so again, I think it goes, goes back to this question of it's not black or white. There really are uh, local funders who are uh, um, take responsibility for some of these organizations. Yeah. I mean, uh, we have a question here from um, uh, from Mark uh, Turner that I actually uh, share his, his, his comment. He's basically saying, you know, to Jack that you know, you're critical of foundations of being uh, non-democratic, or let's put it less democratic than uh, federations, but federations are not democratically elected uh, in any way. Generally, uh, you just, the qualifications are just wealth and willingness to serve. Um, so, you know, yes. how are they then more democratic than a foundation who at the very least they spend their own money, they're not making decisions about larger communal funds. Um, right, right. So I'll, I'll tell you the, the federation version of this uh, yeah. or, or answer. And what, what people at federations say is uh, that's it's correct. Certainly it, it is correct to say that uh, people who make large contributions have an outsized say in, in matters. Uh, but that having been said, the system is structured, number one, to arrive at consensus, which is one of the things, by the way, that drives big funders crazy, uh, because consensus decision making is slow, um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a process that many don't have the patience for. But if you're trying to build consensus, that already suggests that there is a, a give and take that occurs. Um, the other element is what was said about at least the past, I'm not sure this is true anymore today, is that there were more upper middle class individuals involved on the various committees um, of federations. Um, I don't know whether that's still the case, as I said, but I suspect it is. And therefore, these individuals, it is said, are somewhat closer to the ground. They have their ear closer uh, to the ground. Uh, I, I mentioned in the report one, uh, one anecdote that was related to me, and that's all it is. It's an anecdote, but I think it does stand for something that's occurred more frequently. And the anecdote was about uh, the biggest giver uh, to a federation uh, who was at a meeting, um, and he was outvoted about uh, making a particular decision. Um, and he was really quite upset about it. The next day he came in, and he fully supported uh, what the decision was because he believed in this consensus-driven approach. Is that, you know, was that universal? Is it universal? I couldn't say. But I think there's more input 
that occurs certainly in the federation system than is true in foundations where often it's the top individuals uh, who call the shots. But to be, to be fair then, if what you said before about uh, foundations doing, you know, taking care of the risk capital and doing all these innovative systems, yes. that, that is something that by definition you cannot do by consensus. Like you, would, you would kill the very idea of it if you would look for consensus. There would have never been consensus on birthright. People would have said, well, we're going to pay for you rich people to go to Israel. Like, that's ridiculous. You know, so isn't that, I mean, are we, compare, are we comparing Apple with oranges right. here? Right. Look, there's no question that what foundations uh, do often is to make bold uh, risks or take bold risks. Right. Um, and that, that is valuable. I'm not, I'm not dismissing the value of that. What I'm more concerned about is, is um, who's looking out for the totality of Jewish needs. Uh, it's great, for example, that a number of the largest foundations have decided that the way to go is to create various types of engagement programs for millennials uh, and also for intermarried Jews. Um, uh, but the question is, what about all the other populations, and who is concerned about those? Um, and that's where it goes back to what we were discussing a little earlier about the need, if we can build it, for greater partnerships between federations that do attend to the needs of the law, the totality of Jews, um, and and these funders. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, there's a power imbalance there. The funders have, have the money to spend. Um, but the federations also have other things going for them. Uh, they've got a history, they've got a broader base, um, and um, they've got a way of making things happen. They can operate. Knowing, knowing what you know today and the things you've uncovered, you know, some of them were trends that we've been, that we, we've been dealing with for they're not new. I mean, you, you gave them some more more weight, but well, we knew them, and some are, some are some are new. Um, but knowing what you know now, what would you like to research next? What do you think is the next step in terms of learning more about the field? Right. Um, so I'll come up with two answers uh, for you. Um, one of them uh, has to do with uh, what I'll call the pipeline. Um, one of the things that that foundations have been have done and that they've created um, is this uh, leading edge uh, right. process, uh, which is designed to create pipelines for uh, new leadership or for those yeah. who are going to assume positions of leadership. Um, I'm concerned about the pipeline that's going to create the next generation of, of big givers uh, and that's going to then educate people. You don't start with someone who's already um, uh, massively wealthy. You start with people who seem to be on their way and you try to, as I, I've used the terms before, socialize and educate them uh, to give. Um, the, the other thing that, that I, I'm interested in doing is to see whether we can figure out a way of holding up a mirror um, to the foundation world that is not designed to beat up on them, uh, but that might be helpful uh, feedback for them uh, as, a, as a means of, of um, well, improving the way in which they go about their work. And again, I think that this, more of this is happening outside of the Jewish philanthropic world. Um, let's try to bring that approach into the Jewish philanthropic world too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give the floor now to Dina for some uh, closing comments. I don't know if we have more questions from uh, um, from the audience. I think there are no more questions. Uh, if anyone wants to throw anything up there, please do. Um, we have a few more minutes left. Um, so I just really wanted to thank Jack and Andres for this conversation. Um, you've raised a lot of topics that we can go a lot deeper in, and so I wanted yeah. to invite everyone on this call, if there is something here of interest, we are, I, I, I'm going to speak for JFN, but I know for Avichai for sure, and I believe JFN as well, we'd, we'd really love to dig deeper into any of the topics. So some of the things we talked about were like the synergies between local and national funders, the Federation Foundation dynamic, um, new funder profiles, 
um, whether you know women givers, millennial givers, orthodox givers, um, ways in which we can build greater transparency and share learning amongst each other. Um, and then these two ideas that Jack just put forward about future research. Um, how do we develop a pipeline? Um, how might we engage with each other possibly around educating the next generation of givers, of big givers, of Jewish big givers, I should say. Um, and how do we hold up that mirror for ourselves? Um, these are really things that we're thinking about um, and we'd really invite anyone on this call and anyone you think who might be interested to engage with us in these conversations. Um, I think we'll only do much better work if we do this together. So thank you again and thank you everyone who joined us. Um, oh, looks like there's actually a question. Um, could you address the growing population of Jews of color and how philanthropy and the community in general can be more welcoming and create opportunities for equity? <laughs> in the last 30 seconds? <laughs> we have three minutes. <laughs> um, look, look, look we, first of all, there, there are a number of organizations that do exist that specifically are concerned about the, the question of of uh, how the, the complexion of the Jewish community has been changing and finding ways to, uh, well, welcome is the word that's used, to uh, ensure that all types of Jews uh, feel that they have a place uh, within, within Jewish life. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly, though, um, what the intention of the question is in terms of philanthropy, other than supporting those types of organizations and of highlighting the fact that we are no longer uh, just a Caucasian, uh, overwhelmingly Ashkenazi Jewish community any longer. Um, uh, I will say parenthetically, I don't know, if we wouldn't call Sephardic Jews, Jews of color necessarily, although some do, uh, but that's, that's a population that I actually try to include uh, in the report uh, because we tend to ignore that population too. Um, and in, ter in terms of the Sephardi population, uh, uh, they are in fact uh, a growing part of this uh, big giving as well. They tend to give to their own institutions, as is true of the Haredim, even though they're not Haredim. Um, but um, we've got to pay attention to them. And certainly I know that some organizations, especially federations, have been doing outreach to involve uh, Sephardic Jews in this process. And uh, presumably the same is happening with Jews of color. Uh, yeah, if I can chip in, I'll say, um, you know, for me personally, it was an eye opener when I got the New York population, the Jewish population study, and found out that 12% of Jews are Jews of color. Yes. So I think, I think that the larger question is how do we relate to a community that, as you say, doesn't look like the community we have in our head. It's a community that is much more diverse than we, than we tend to think. And, and how do we you know, change our mental model of what the community is? You know, concomitantly, we're having a, a board conversation within the JFN about is there a role that philanthropy can play in making the community more welcoming to Jews of color? But I don't know if welcoming is the right term, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. more, more, more open um, uh, towards, towards uh, Jew, Jews of color uh, in, 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 long, in broad sense. Yes, yeah. and in that sense, I think that actually Israel could be helpful to us. Because, 100%. Because yeah. in Israel, not that everything has been worked out perfectly, but clearly um, Israeli society has struggled with those issues and has worked hard. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, that's it for the Q&A. So I just wanted to thank everyone again for joining and just to reiterate the invitation to continue the conversations. Thanks, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.